I think they ask people like me to give TED Talks because I've had some success, and some would say I'm at the top of my game. I'm president of one of the nation's leading academic medical centers. I've managed multi-billion dollar organizations. My research has saved lives. I've helped change the way people think about health, particularly women's health. And I've worked with world leaders on urgent issues in global health. I've been around the block a few times, so maybe this is the top of my game. But the dirty little secret I'm going to share with you today is that I'm not even really sure what that game is, and I'm far less sure how to play it competitively. None of us in science and medicine have the answers we tell you we have, because the universe of what we don't know dwarfs that of what we do know. I know you're thinking, what on earth is she talking about? I thought they only let smart people give these talks. What I'm saying is, we've talked ourselves into thinking we know how the body works, how drugs treat disease, how a lot of things supposedly do a lot of other things. We are proud of everything we know, but we've made stunning progress as a society, gaining knowledge. But the simple truth is that what we actually have is not knowledge at all. What has disguised itself as knowledge is actually information that it is going to morph or frame shift into something else next week, next year, maybe 10 or 50 years. Bottom line, it's not permanent, and there are so many examples. When I was in medical school, everyone knew that stomach ulcers were caused by being stressed out and or eating too much spicy food. This is what everyone knew to be true. Until it wasn't. Until we found out that not stress, not anxiety, and thankfully not pizza caused stomach ulcers. <laughs> no, it wasn't until Barry Marshall and Robin Warren discovered that stomach ulcers were caused by the bacterium H. pylori, and clinicians found that you could zap the bacterium and make it go away, and you and I could get back to worrying and eating junk food. Although, as a cardiologist, I'm not advising it. You see, each bit of new information is but a blip in what we know. New information supplants old information, and the cycle continues. What I can tell you with certainty is this: knowledge as we know it is fragile and ever fleeting. But you don't have to take my word for it. The annals of history are brimming with amazing discoveries. Which have been transformed into knowledge, that have changed the world, changed medicine, changed society, changed us. It is clear that many things have changed in our lifetime for the better, but it's not because of what we know. Rather, the most significant progress we have attained is traceable not to knowledge, but to another concept: humility. Humility is a simple-sounding word that belies the complexity behind what it means to be humble, and why being humble even matters beyond polite discourse. The dictionary definition of humility is a low or modest view of one's importance, and its synonyms are modesty, humbleness, meekness, unassertiveness. To be clear, the humility I'm talking about today goes far beyond polite discourse. What's humbling to me, philosophically speaking, is that we humans are but the teeniest of cogs in the vast universe of forces, thoughts, objects, and things. Despite all of our knowledge, we humans are desperately in the dark about how most things work. Humility is the secret ingredient that unveils truth and brings about change. For most people, the birth of a child is a wondrous, memorable event. It's often referred to as a miracle. The change of a child coming into our lives when it happens is truly humbling, intellectually humbling, because it causes us to question what we know and whether we know enough. 
To a scientist like me, it is far more remarkable. Experiencing the birth of my first child some 28 years ago on a snowy Boston day was truly memorable for my husband Gary and me. To a parabiologist, that such a thing as gestation could occur on its own for nine months, and most of the time so flawlessly, was borderline inconceivable, if you pardon the pun. That's because in the laboratory we have virtually no idea how to do the vast majority of things the body does according to its own elegantly written script. We can grow cells in the lab, but do we really think they represent those in our skin, our heart, our brains? Not really. Put simply, we're nowhere near being able to pull off what nature does so effortlessly. We're fairly sure, in this case I'd say reasonably sure, that our organs are composed primarily of cells and other components that keep our living systems active and alive. But do we really think they mimic our vital organs, such as the heart and the liver? Do they function anywhere near as well as the real thing, such that we can create organs on demand? The mysteries of nature routinely humble us to the core of our being. But all is not lost. Just because we as humans remain humble, baffled by so many things, it's hardly a reason to hang it up all up and go into, say, investment banking. <laughs> Rather, the situation in which we find ourselves is one of enormous, exciting, and important opportunity. To seize this opportunity, we must be willing to say and to believe that knowledge is fleeting and real progress is about changing dogma and redefining things. To venture into the unknown with intellectual humility, giving ourselves permission to feel comfortable in this uncomfortable space. In the vernacular of everyday life for people like you and me, it's about having the courage to doubt or challenge the status quo to step away from what's known to be fact and to say, what if it's not? Let's all allow ourselves just to see what happens without trying to predict ahead of time what the outcome is going to be. One individual with this capability was Dr. Joseph Murray, a very dear friend who passed away in 2012. Joe worked at the Brigham for 64 years and was a wonderful clinician, mentor, scientist, and teacher. He even got one of those shiny gold medals they give out for really big ideas in science and medicine. Joe was an incredible human being, an unassuming gentleman, whose desire to help humankind drove his creative experimentation and his many discoveries in the laboratory that had a profound impact on human health. Back around World War II, Joe was a young army doc with few preconceived notions and a desire to alleviate human suffering. Having just graduated from medical school, Joe was assigned to a plastic surgery unit at Valley Forge General Hospital in Pennsylvania, where he cared for the casualties of war, young soldiers with severe burns. Often, the only available method of treatment was to transplant skin from cadavers, the less fortunate who did not survive, and to drape the cut skin over the soldiers' wounds. Without that protective coating, the soldiers would quickly die of fluid loss and infection. When we worked together, Joe shared with me that his experience at Valley Forge Hospital got him thinking about how to recycle tissue and how this concept might apply to vital organs. So after World War II, the 35-year-old Joe Murray boldly dove into the unknown with a very basic set of assumptions and one desired outcome, to transplant a solid organ, in this case a kidney, from one identical twin 
to another with the goal of saving the ailing twin's life. The ability to produce urine would signal success. That both twins should survive would change the future of medicine. And survive they did. Joe did his first human transplant with the hope and the belief that it would succeed, but without insisting or assuming that it would. To me, that is intellectual humility, not intellectual arrogance. We now know Joe as the father of human organ transplantation, but he also helped to spearhead immunology research and helped to pioneer anti-rejection medication. This breakthrough, that a medication could prevent the, the rejection of a transplanted organ, propelled the field forward by allowing transplantation between unrelated donors. And today, more than 100,000 organs are transplanted each year throughout the world. But it might not have been that way if the Joe Murray I knew were a little less humble or a little more entrenched in the world of the known. If Joe had not embraced his naivete as he faced the unknown, if he didn't use his lack of knowledge as an opportunity to experiment creatively to save life of another human being. Joe often told me his naysayers discouraged him, vigorously saying, it'll never work. Dumb idea. Too dangerous. Don't even try. I, for one, am glad he did. I learned early on in my career the dangers of being too entrenched in what I knew. I was a hotshot resident working at one of the finest academic institutions in this country. I was then, as now, working in Boston, an intellectual hotbed for science and medicine. I knew how to make great clinical decisions. I was trained by the best. I was confident, and others were confident in me. I knew what to do until that day I didn't. Until that day, I'll never forget for the rest of my life. I'm in the emergency room at the Brigham, one of the busiest urban hospitals in this country, when in walks a 32-year-old woman. Pretty non-distinct symptoms. She wasn't feeling well. She was tired, difficulty sleeping, a bit of a cough, a low-grade fever. So I ordered the usual tests chest x-ray, an electrocardiogram, some blood tests, and I couldn't find anything. I thought, maybe she has a viral syndrome. So I sent her home on Tylenol for her fever and her aches. To my horror, two days later, she returned to the, to the emergency room, having suffered a full-blown heart attack. A 32-year-old woman? A heart attack? It's not possible. That's what I knew. I was taught that heart disease was a man's disease, and the role of the woman was to support her husband, brother, father, significant other. But today, medical residents and fellows know better. Today, we know that when many women suffer a heart attack, they don't experience chest pain, but they feel tired, weak, just like my patient. And today, we know that heart disease is the number one killer of women in this country. But back then, I missed the diagnosis. I was mortified. I felt so stupid. My gold-plated knowledge had failed me big time. But thankfully, I received a reprieve. My patient survived and did well, and I learned an extremely valuable lesson. So I return to this simple concept of humility. I'm talking about the everyday kind of intellectual humility that allows you and I to accept the fact that most of what we know will change. It will, before long, become wrong. And there's nothing wrong with being wrong. We're only at the beginning of understanding life. Maybe we're only halfway into the first chapter. Maybe we don't even have the right words. 
And maybe, not maybe, but most certainly, the story is written in multiple languages that we cannot yet comprehend. There is far more to health and disease, more broadly speaking about humanity itself, that is either knowledge cloaked in false security or simply really good guesses. My message today is a positive one. It's an urgent call to action to redefine what knowing means, to be intellectually humble, to embrace the unknown, and to know for sure that it's okay not to be sure. Have the intellectual courage to say, I don't know, because it's empowering, and only then can you add, and I'm going to find out. Hold your head high and press on. Into the unknown we go. Thank you.